Thank you, Harold. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for being here uh, today. Um, this is a very intimidating uh, situation for me. Uh, I'm used to working with uh, adoption professionals. I'm used to working with adoptive parents. But I'm used to doing that in my language. Uh, with no accent, <laughs> I guess. And I know, I know them, I know the people, I know their concerns, I know what uh, type of you know, things they deal with in their daily life as parents or as professionals. So here I am, several thousand kilometers away from home, talking to a group of uh, wonderful people who decided to spend part of uh, their time today to, to come here with this beautiful title. I didn't know what to do with for a number of days. When I, when I started thinking of these, I said, OK, this is beautiful, but uh, how do I do it? I mean, what, what, what can I do with, with, with this, with this title? Um, so although I'm very pleased to be here, I'm very grateful for uh, the invitation and the opportunity, not only to be for the very first time at UMass, but also for meeting some new colleagues and uh, some wonderful people here, also for the opportunity of um, this uh, morning with you here. What I'm going to tell you comes from my experience as an adoptive father, uh, to begin with, and uh, also my experience as a researcher. We have been doing uh, conducting research, and Carmen, one of our PhD students, is here with us today. She's spending uh, a few months here uh, at UMass. Uh, we have been conducting a longitudinal study uh, of uh, intercountry adoptees, and we are following children and families for a number of years now. We are now in the middle of our fourth data collection, when children have been at home for, at, at their adoptive homes for some 11, 12 years now. We just finished a study, and part of the inspiration for uh, some of the things I want to tell you today come from a study we just finished about adoption disruptions, about adoptions that didn't go well. And we have spent time trying to understand that and what was involved and uh, how many of those disruptions could have been avoided with maybe timely and more efficacious professional intervention. Um, so part of, part of the background here in, in my mind today uh, has to do with uh, all, all those different things. And uh, I would like to start with a few you know, general issues. And the first one is about uh, diversity. Uh, Hal was stressing this in his uh, presentation, how children are different. And uh, every child is different. And parents are different as well. And something that goes well for me uh, maybe it wouldn't go well with you. And uh, so we need to be aware of the fact that there is no one single way to uh, be a good parent. I mean, there are many different ways to be a bad parent as well, of course. <laughs> but uh, being a good, parent, a good parent can happen in many different ways. There is no you know, standard uh, uh, rule or a standard way to be a parent, and uh, each one of us is finding his own way to being a parent. Uh, most of us are doing our job uh, wonderfully well. Uh, we have problems, we have difficulties, but uh, most of us do a good job with our children, basically because we have commitment, we have love, we have support when we need it, um, but there are many different ways to do it. And we don't need to look for perfection. Perfection, if possible, is quite tiresome. It's, uh, I think in my life I have known two or three perfect people. Not my favorite people, I must say. Not my favorite 
I feel more relaxed with people with imperfections. Maybe because I need to accept myself. So, uh, so mistakes are part of our, you know, our mistakes and difficulties and things that we, after a few days or years, we think, well, maybe I should have done it differently. Uh, that's part of it, and it's good to accept it. I think, and it, it's look to take us as we are, as people who are not perfect and who don't want to be perfect. Because being perfect is, if, again, if possible, uh, at, at least for me, is not, uh, you know, something I would like to, I would like to be. Another very basic thing for me, I believe, is that adoption is not pathology. And adopted children, even adopted children with problems and with difficulties, have no major mental health issues. It doesn't mean that they don't have problems, that they don't have difficulties, that they don't, don't have challenges. It is that uh, their problems are within the range of um, diversity, uh, within the range of uh, normality. Even when in some aspects, in some areas, they have more, uh, more serious and more enduring difficulties. And the same is true for us, for adoptive parents. We face many challenges and many difficulties. Some of those are similar to any other parent, but some of our problems and difficulties are exacerbated, accentuated by the fact that adopted children come with a history of adversity. There is no adoption without adversity, without previous adversity. There is no adept adoption with no uh, separation. Uh, so adoption is about uh, providing children with early adversity, uh, children with experience of separation and losses, providing them with an stable, consistent, loving, permanent family. So uh, there are the difficulties around the only negative experiences that many of these children have, but also some of the difficulties created by the fact that being an adoptive person takes some effort to understand what does it mean and what the implications are and how to connect my new identity with my past uh, life, with other aspects of my identity that uh, are in my pre-adoption uh, history. So there are many joys in adoptive parenting. Uh, adoption is a way for many of us to fulfill uh, a family project, a parenting project. And it is, a, it is a wonderful opportunity to enjoy our life as a family, and to enjoy our, our life as parents, and to enjoy contributing to the progress of our children and to overcome the difficulties and the problems that we face. And uh, so it's very nice navigating the calm waters mm -hmm. that are part of our life, uh, that uh, are part of our experience, and, and enjoying that, and, and, and being able to provide uh, both to the child and to our families. With that wonderful opportunities, I think that's very positive and very, very stimulating. stimulating. But there are also difficulties in the adoptive parenting. Some are kind of, you know, daily life, uh, small problems, small difficulties. Some other difficulties are there for, for longer, are more enduring. Sometimes we have problems in finding the resources to deal with those difficulties that other people have uh, more easily because there are more services around and more people who are familiar with the problems. So um, the title from, for, for this talk was um, given to me uh, after some discussions about how it takes to deal with this more enduring, more difficult, more you know, constant, permanent problems. 
and how difficult it is to swim against the tide, how difficult it is to go against the learned models of relationship, to swim against the learned models of behavior, to go against the, you know, many of the things that the, our children uh, come with and that we have to face every day. So I believe that the title, The Navigation of the Rough Waters, come uh, from, uh, from these discussions we had about um, possibilities for this talk. Thinking about the rough waters metaphor, I thought that there could be a distinction between the surface rough waters and the underground rough waters. So we find these rough waters, the surface rough waters in, in the adoptees, in their difficult behavior, in the challenges, in their uh, uh, difficulty sometimes to express or to feel uh, uh, love uh, for us. There are surface rough waters in the adopters, in terms of difficult parenting, all the issues with behavioral management, with, with um, setting limits and with consistency and all that. And uh, the other part is the underground rough waters. And here I thought that perhaps in the adoptees there were at least two main issues with, with these underground rough waters. One is emotional vulnerability, and the other one has to do with identity issues. And in the adopters, I thought that perhaps we could think of two main rough waters areas. One has to do with their the parents' emotional issues and the, uh, sometimes the difficulty to, to, to bond uh, the emotional distance problem. And another area was, I think, or is, I think, the unmet expectations for, <coughs> of, the, uh, of the adopters. So in my talk today, I'm going to concentrate in, on these underground rough waters. I'm not going to cover the surface rough waters, although they will appear. Uh, at the end. Uh, I will um, concentrate on this whole part, on the underground rough waters, and I want to share with you some ideas about these uh, problems of emotional vulnerability and identity issues in the children, uh, our own attachment and emotional problems or difficulties, and, uh, and the unmet expectations. So let me start with the emotional vulnerability part of it. Um, attachment is, is a key issue in uh, relationships, in families, also in adoption, of course. Uh, when we think of attachment, we normally think of attachment behaviors. Um, and uh, that is, of course, important. And that is a very meaningful part of our attachment system. Uh, but there are also attachment representations. That, that is the underground part of attachment. So let me start very briefly, because I want to focus mainly on the attachment representations part. Let me start with the behavior part. Um, after a few weeks, a few months, sometimes a few years in their new family, most adoptive children are attached to their adoptive parents. And most of them have developed a secure attachment. Not because they came with a secure attachment. It is because through our therapeutic parenting, by being there, by being available, by being responsive to their needs, by being consistent in responding to their, uh, to their needs, they developed, they learned to develop a secure attachment. Secure attachment means that if, when they are distressed, when they are in pain, when they are experiencing difficulties, they know they can come to us. They come to us. And when we comfort them, they are comforted. And, and um, their pain or their distress kind of goes away, and they can go back to playing, studying, uh, doing the doing their things, so uh, secure attachment becomes predominant among adoptees after a uh, period of time in the adoptive family. It is true that insecure attachment 
is a bit uh, more represented in uh, adoptees than in the general population of children. But I want to emphasize that insecure attachment is not pathology. Insecure attachment means that when they are distressed, when a child is distressed or in pain or in the middle of some difficulties, sometimes it is less easy for her or him to look for help, to look for comfort. And when the comfort is provided, sometimes it's a bit more difficult for them to take that comfort in, to feel comforted, to feel at ease, to feel relaxed. At the end, they come and they receive comfort. It is only that they, it takes a bit more of an effort for them to do it. But that, that's it. That's no more than that. If those of us who are here are good representatives of the general population, and I guess we are, around 25% of us were insecurely attached as infants. Around 10% of us had a disorganized attachment as infants. So around 35% of us who are here today, if we represent the general population, around 35% of us were not securely attached to our primary attachment figures. And here we are, many years later, doing our lives, conducting our lives, being good citizens, being able to love others, being able to make others happy, being able to take happiness from our relationship with others. The problem that we, those of us who were insecurely attached, have is that sometimes it takes a bit more of an effort. And when our partner tells us, let me alone, instead of saying, well, he's having a bad, you know, bad day, we start humiliating and saying, wow, what's going on here? I'm not able to make this person happier, as happy as I would like to. So we kind of uh, think about it and have a more difficult time about it. But that's it. We're good parents. We're good people. It is only that it takes a bit more of an effort to be happy, sometimes, not, not all the time, particularly under these uh, interpersonal uh, difficulties. So insecure attachment, sometimes I, in, in Spain and in other countries in Europe, I hear people and I hear professionals talking about insecure, oh, this child has an insecure attachment with the adoptive mother. And I always think, well, probably I also had an insecure attachment with my mother. And here I am. <laughs> Not meaning that I am, you know, the ideal person, but meaning that, you know, it doesn't interfere with my well-being, with my mental health. It is only that it takes me a bit more of an effort sometimes to uh, understand and to negotiate in, in the more emotional uh, kind of situations. Some of the people, some of the children uh, in a percentage which is a bit higher than in the general population of children uh, present with uh, this disorganized attachment. Disorganized means that it's more kind of uh, chaotic, it's less predictable. It, it, it means that sometimes they behave in ways that are more difficult to understand. Uh, but still, this is within, this is not attachment pathology. Uh, it, it, it's a more complicated type of normal attachment, if you wish. But uh, uh, it doesn't uh, imply that there is a, you know, an important mental health issue involved. One of the things to understand with uh, attachment behaviors is that they are specific to people. So a child could be securely attached to the mother and have an insecure attachment to the father and, and have a, a secure attachment to uh, another main caretaker. So 
the attachment behaviors are specific to people. Um, and as I said before, um, the positive attachment behaviors of any of the kind I mentioned before are in place normally after the first or the first two post-adoption year. How about the um, attachment representations? Let me tell you a little bit about the attachment representations. The attachment representations form very early in our life, depending on our attachment experiences, early experiences. And the attachment representations have two main components. How do I see others? How do I see the other as a source of security or insecurity? As uh, someone I can trust in or I should fear about. As someone whose proximity evokes feelings of fear and threat or feelings of uh, relaxation and comfort. So that's my view of, of the of the other, and the self-side component has to do uh, about with how do I see myself? Do I see myself as, as someone who, who deserves being loved and being uh, looked after? Or as someone who is not good, who will never be good, who is to be rejected, who is to be you know, not liked? Those are the two main components of the attachment representations. How do I see the other in the relationships, in the proximity, and how do I see myself in these uh, situations? These representations, representations form early and tend to be uh, very enduring. And they travel from our first attachment relationships to new uh, close relationships. So they travel with us to new emotional relationships. When children have experienced any type of maltreatment, neglect, uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, any kind of maltreatment, normally their attachment representations are impaired, are, are affected and they mistrust the other. They see the other not as a source of security or comfort. They tend to see the other as a threatening, as a, a source of um, uncertainty, of insecurity. And when they start receiving a more consistent uh, and positive uh, situation, they start changing that representation of the other and the representation of, of themselves. But it is important to realize that the new representations that are formed uh, under these new interactions, under these new relationships, these new representations do not replace the damaged ones from the previous experiences. They compete. They are both inside the child. And they compete the one with the other. They don't disappear easily, there is a competition more than a replacement. It is not to mean that the children, and I will give you one or two examples to uh, exemplify uh, what I'm trying to say, but it doesn't mean that the children are all the time uh, working in the mode of uh, insecure representations. After some time in the new um, positive attachment circumstances, they, these representations start changing um, and the negative part of them are typically activated under very special circumstances circumstances of stress, circumstances of confrontations, uh, of confrontation, um, circumstances of, you know, when they feel that um, their placement is at risk, when they feel that they are not um, being able to be uh, as they would like to be, to make their parents happy or 
those circumstances. So it is not that the children are all the time working under the insecure attachment representations mode. It is that this insecure attachment representation mode, particularly this organization and avoidance, and I will uh, exemplify that now, um, are activated under these um, stressful uh, circumstances. And these are the underground rough waters uh, in the chat. To me, these are probably the main source of under, underground rough waters in, in the child. It comes with uh, feelings of distress, of anxiety, of insecurity, deep inside the child. When these uh, negative uh, circumstances, when these stressful and negative confrontations are happening, sometimes they go into this disorganized fantasy. So we're going to have a car accident. We're going to you know, die all together. And the house is going to fall apart. And we will be there in the house. And that will happen in the middle of the night. So this fantasy is that the child cannot control. But just you know, uh, going on inside, inside the child. It is when they fear that their stability is threatened. And they, they feel this fear of, of, of new abandonment. Uh, and one of the problems with these attachment representations is that they look for confirmation. Uh, so they behave in a way trying to confirm that their negative representations are, are right. Uh, let me give you an example. Let me give you the example of Monica. Monica is a girl I worked with a few years ago. She was the, uh, she had a, uh, an, an early experiences of uh, severe neglect by a birth mother who was very chaotic, very unpredictable. She was placed in a foster care home, uh, and things didn't go well there after a few months. Her behavior, Monica's behavior, she was three at the time, but her behavior was very complicated very difficult to interpret, to understand, because it was very unpredictable. As unpredictable as her, her birth mother actually was. So she was, she was kind of feeling well when she arrived to that foster home. But after a few months, she was removed. And there was, she was placed in another family, now for adoption, with the intention of adoption. But again, things didn't go well, particularly with the, the adoptive uh, mother-to-be. Um, she loved, Monica loved that, that woman. And, and she thought that would be a you know, wonderful woman, uh, mother for her. But things didn't go well. She didn't know how to you know, deal with the difficulties. Their parents didn't, uh, they didn't receive uh, the support that they would uh, think that they needed. And Monica had to be removed. So adoption professionals knew that Monica's next placement should happen in a special home. She could be taken to any home because Monica was needy, was in need of you know truly therapeutic parents, parents who were very committed, who could understand the difficulties and the complexities of her behavior. And that. So she was placed for the third time when she was five in a in a new home for adoption. And things went very well during the first three or four weeks. Everything was perfect. And then suddenly, one night, at the dinner table, after dinner, Monica vomited uh, on the table. So a small accident. and. Uh, Parents, you know, dealt with that, no problem. The problem was that on the next day, Monica vomited again. And once and again, she was vomiting. So they started looking for medical help. They went to all kinds of, you know, specialists and hospitals and all kinds of tests and all that, um, just to discover that nothing was wrong with her system, with her digestive system. So they were told, this must be something emotional. Uh, maybe she need, you need some uh, clinical help. 
So, yes, they look for help. They went to a clinical psychologist with no expertise in adoption, by the way, who tried her best making two big mistakes. One, she took the problem as a behavioral problem. So her goal was to regulate parents' behaviors around the incident, uh, because that was, you know, just the problem was the, that the Monica was vomitating. And the second mistake I believe this psychologist did was to interpret that Monica's behavior meant that she was rejecting what she was given. So she is kind of rejecting you. She's saying that she's not happy here because she gives you back whatever you give her in. So uh, things didn't change. Everything kept as it was, and Monica kept with her behavior and all that. When I saw Monica, my interpretation was just the opposite. So vomiting, vomitating? Vomiting. Vomiting? Oh, thank you. <laughs> vomiting is the behavior. But there is something else behind this. And in my interpretation, it is not that Monica was rejecting. It is that she was looking for confirmation. She was looking for confirmation of her internal representations of attachment. In her internal representation of, atta of attachment, the main things were, I am ugly. I don't deserve being loved. I don't trust others. They are going, they seem to be nice. The other families I was with seem to be nice at the beginning. They seem to be nice. But sooner or later, they are going to show me, you know, the exit door. So I will try to confirm this. I'm going to behave in a way that is unacceptable. I'm going to show how ugly I can be. And they are going to show me that when I am ugly, they don't like me. And if that is going to happen, I want it to happen as soon as possible. Because in my previous experiences, it was difficult for me. Once I was feeling well, one, once I was feeling loved, uh, it was very difficult for me to be sent away. So th that's part of the difficulties, I believe, with these children. The, the questions they ask sometimes are asked in a very contradictory way. So they ask for. They say something meaning something completely different. And that is the difficulty, and where here <coughs> is where we have to swim against the tide. This is the upstream swimming that is very often so tiring, so distressing, so discouraging, because we don't see the progress. The progress is there if we keep consistent. If we keep our, you know, uh, behaviors and our attachment, uh, so the thing here is how to parent for the improvement of this emotional vulnerability. And one of our tasks is to uh, provide reportive information for that broken down emotional rather, which is asking the wrong questions or which is asking the questions in a way that it is very difficult to understand. And sometimes that, um, that kind of provokes our, a reaction that will confirm the negative expectations that uh, the child has inside as a consequence of all the previous experiences. So this will call for the consistency in our attachment behaviors, being always there, messages of pertinence 
messages of permanency, messages of trust. So when Monica's parents, adoptive parents, started showing her that it was all right for her to vomit, make, started talking about plans for the summer. This was, I believe, January, February. They were making plans for the summer and for the next year. So messages of permanence in summer, next Christmas, when you are 15, when you turn 18, we'll be together and we'll do this and we'll do that. So these messages of permanency and message of, messages of trust, messages of uh, you know, confidence in, in, in her and in her capacity. So here is where the emotional closeness becomes so important, particularly at times of difficulties and at times of distress. Hal and, and his uh, group have uh, done research about the importance of this emotional closeness, closeness for all these difficulties. So let me give you a very, very simple, straightforward message. Particularly at time of difficulties, make sure that the emotional bridge is not broken. Keep the emotional bridge active and use it. Use it no matter what the difficulties are. No matter. I remember when my daughter was a teenager and we went through a period of, uh, you know, a little bit of a headache, I would, I would say. <laughs> I remember that period. I remember a few mistakes or a number of mistakes I made. But the only mistake I didn't make was to keep close, was to be there and show positive emotions and show emotional closeness. This is critical, particularly at a time of difficulties and time of distress. Remember, the underground rough waters in the attachment representations are saying something different. They would, don't trust them. Don't trust, not them, because one of the things I didn't mention is that whereas attachment behaviors are specific to persons, the attachment representations are generalized. Travel to other relationships, and that is true at home, at school, in, with the new partner, uh, when they start, you know, uh, having partners. Uh, so these attachment representations travel to the child, not to one person but to all those new relationships. Second aspect of the uh, underground rap waters in the children have to do uh, has to do with identity issues and the identity of our children is sometimes a very complex puzzle very uh, particularly uh, regarding pre-adoption. Some of the pieces of the puzzle are unknown. And some other pieces of the puzzle are difficult to handle, difficult to understand, difficult to accept. So this is, this is what, what makes uh, the adoption identity more complex. Uh, and our colleague David Plotzinski has uh, emphasized how if adoption comes with profound benefits, it also comes inevitably with losses and losses of you know, significant people, losses of relationships, and sometimes losses of culture, many different losses, and, and this can create inside the child feelings of sadness and feelings of confusion. And again, this has nothing to do with mental health. It is not to mean that they are you know, traumatized and they can uh, live their lives as, no, it is just that sometimes, not all the time, particularly at times of difficulty, particularly at times of life transitions, they can um, uh, experience these feelings of sadness and confusion. And these feelings are very often exacerbated by poor, poor communication with adoptive parents who don't see that, who don't understand that, who are not comfortable with that, uh, who are not able to uh, put themselves in the child's shoes. In the cases of uh, transracial adoptions, uh, it is the lack of uh, ethnic and racial socialization. Very often, more and more, we are studying 
what we call microaggressions, when you know children are told things that um, hurt them, um, comments about, so you are adopted. Uh, so why didn't your mother keep you? Uh, how much did you cost? Uh, do you know your real mother? Uh, those questions and comments, sometimes more indirect, other times very direct, that are, you know, um, humiliating and emotionally disturbing for the child, and this is intensified under some special circumstances. So another task we have as adoptive parents is parenting against the sadness and confusion that are part of this uh, adoption identity issues. One of the main mistakes adoptive parents sometimes make is to identify communication with transmission of information. So my role is to tell the child what I know about his or her past. Meaning, if I don't have much information, there is little I can talk about with him or with her, because there is no information to transmit. And, and that's the, the that, that's a wrong interpretation of, of the uh, communication. Because communication is, is not mainly about giving information, informing about facts. Communication is mainly about being close. It's about sharing. Sometimes sharing information, all the time sharing the sadness for the lack of information that both you and I are feeling now at this very moment. So there is nothing I can tell you about the question you're asking me, but we can talk about that question. And we can talk about our emotions around, those, uh, around that question. And we can talk about how you feel. And what can we do about it? So communication, communicative openness, as David Brzezinski has defined it, has to do not with transmission of information. It has to do with this atmosphere of open, honest, non-defensive, and emotionally attuned uh, family dialogue. Communication implies both talking and listening. We parents normally are very good at talking. We tend to be quite good at talking. Uh, meaning that not always we are so good at listening. Listening not only what the child says, also what the child expresses. Also in the nonverbal communication and the understanding of, of, of its meaning and implication. It's about creating a context where talking and listening can happen in this atmosphere of communicative openness where warmth and emotion sharing are the key ingredients. It is not about transmission of information. It is about uh, sharing. And it's about proximity. It's about all the things. It's a, someone have um, uh, talked about this technique of the strong throwing. So there you are, close in, in, at the border of a lake. You throw a stone. You know those waves will get to the, you know, you call it the end of the lane, to the shore, but you never know how or when. So when you tell your child, well, I mean, you draw so nicely. There must have been artists in your birth family. You don't need to say anything else. You don't need to wait for an answer. You are saying, I also think about them. We can talk about it. I'm giving you a positive message about it. That's it. You don't need to follow up. You don't need to, you know, to be there to see if the wave comes to the shore. Just throw the stone and, and give it to have an impact, to have an effect. But what you are saying with that is very meaningful. It, has, it comes with, with many different implications. And uh, of course, the uh, support of the 
search of origins. We normally think of search of origins as the um, attempts of the abuti to find information, to find people. So this is, again, surface waters. But there is another approach to search of origins, which is the inner search. Questions children or adults ask about inside themselves without asking anyone. Not every day, particularly in, under some circumstances when, you know, when they are going to get married, when they are going to have a child. But this, this is not a child's only issue. It, it goes with you as part of your adoptive identity. In circumstances where you think of, of your birth parents or maybe of your birth siblings or... So this is not the outer search. This is the inner search. If we ignore that that inner search is there, we won't provide the atmosphere. If we take search of origin, as the requests of the child for the open requests for information, for contact, we are missing the other part. And every adopted person is, at some point in his or her life, at several points actually in his or her life, involved in this inner search. This is normative, 100% of the adoptees search for their origin in this regard. They wonder, they ask, they, they see themselves in the mirror. This nose, what does this nose come from? Who had this nose? And what happened with this? Or, what ha or I would like now to whatever. So, but if we ignore that that is going on, we probably won't provide the um, atmosphere that is required for um, uh, these rough waters to come down. And Han and uh, David have shown how this open and work communication is linked to better outcomes in several aspects, identity, self-esteem, behavior, and all that. Things are a bit more complicated or a bit another, have another layer uh, when uh, we are talking about uh, transracial adoptions and where um, ethnic and racial socialization are involved, where adoptive parents need to provide verbal and behavioral endorsement of the, this racial ethnic socialization by providing cultural and life experiences. Um, every parent who is involved in a transracial adoption will need to decide when, how, and how much ethnic socialization will, will do. For sure, we'll, we'll find. So here it's very important, uh, the attunement, uh, the attitude, the openness, providing the opportunity for the child to share at home the experiences of why, if we deny them, then it is more likely that the child wouldn't express them. So it's only when we provide with this open... Uh, and as our colleagues Ellen Pinder Hughes and Amanda Baden put it, we have to choose our battles. We have to decide whether in front of reactions of bias and microaggressions to educate. So. Sometimes we need to educate others about adoption. Our children's teachers, sometimes they don't have the experience, they don't have the knowledge. They need to be educated, and we need to be the advocates for that education. We need to do it. So for some people, we want to, to tell them, what is this about? What does it mean, adoption? What does it mean, being adopted? And in some other cases, the strategy is confrontation. You don't accept certain comments, attitudes, and you are there with your child against those attitudes. And sometimes you choose to ignore because it's a battle that you don't want to fight. And it is not, you know, you, you, you go around that uh, somehow. 
And we have to prepare children for all these, you know, stereotypes and, and, and bias. And there are many different ways, providing them with experiences, facilitating contact, cultural mentoring. There are different ways to do it. OK, now let me move on to the adoptive parents' rough waters. And uh, part of this comes from our studies about this, the adoption of disruption that I mentioned before. Of course, we parents have our own attachment issues, our own attachment history, our own attachment uh, problems. It is true that we know from research that parent security fosters children's security. And parents' disorganization fosters children's disorganization as well. So uh, it is important that we keep that clear in, in our mind, particularly when we are adoption professionals, and uh, we have to work with prospective adopters, and uh, we need to do home studies, and we need to do to support adoptive parents. So we parents have had our own experiences of separation, our own experiences of losses, and we have had emotional, interpersonal, interpersonal conflicts. It doesn't mean then that in order to be a a good parent, uh, you have had no experiences of emotional difficulties. It is that you have had those experiences, but you were able to grow out of them, to grow to a more secure, to a more stable model of relationships. So it is not that, that when we look for prospective adopters, when we look for families for children, we need to look for people who are emotionally, you know, untouched or emotionally only happy, because there are many sides uh, inside each of us. We need to look for people who have been able, no matter their difficulties, to build this model of stable, consistent, positive uh, emotional relationships. The emotional bonding is critically important uh, not always easy, not always straightforward. straightforward. When a child is adopted, the parents and the children are strangers to each other, and the child's behavior is not always appealing, it's not always reinforcing, as normally little babies are. They're very appealing, they're very reinforcing, but we're not talking about young babies here. So the mutual adjustment might, may, might take time and might take effort. Uh, it is not automatic. So um, some parents feel bad because I, sh I think I should feel that I love him, but I still don't feel that. Or I don't fully feel it because I, sometimes I kind of uh, am violent and all that. So it takes time and it is good to know that it will take time. The key component, I believe, for this emotional uh, availability, for this emotional, uh, excuse me, for this emotional bonding, for the for for the building of the attachment relationship, has to do with the availability, being there, being there for the child, sensitivity to respond to his or her needs, to understand his or her needs, mind-mindedness, mindedness, meaning to be able to understand the child's mind, to be able to put yourself in your child's shoes, to understand that your child has motives, has um, reasons, has perspectives, and to try to understand how his or her behavior should be placed in the context of what's going on inside, inside the child. The closeness is so critically important, not only the physical uh, closeness, but, but also you know, the, the more emotional part of it, the consistency in dealing with the daily life things and the being able to enjoy, to enjoy your child, to enjoy the relationship, being able to uh, enjoy small progresses, to know that things will take a bit longer than what you would like, but to keep you know, the hope and the enjoyment. Uh, and this is a battle that a uh, army of one person cannot win. So this is a, 
this is a battle for, for an army. This is a battle for several people. Uh, even if you are a single mother or a single father, uh, you will need all the people with you in that, uh, in that battle. So it is, it is not only a, a mother only, or a mother mainly. Uh, the more, in the case of couples, the more they are uh, ready to work together to uh, do things, to share, and to um, you know, work together, uh, the easier it will be for them to do it. And sometimes uh, professional help is needed with this, and good professional help. One of the problems, you know, one of the problems we found in this study of adoption right now, most of the adoption disruptions happened when children were in their early teen ages, when around 13, 14 years is the age when most of the breakdowns uh, tend to happen. But when we look at these cases in detail, we see that in most cases, the problems didn't start at that age. In most cases, the problems were there from the very beginning. And very often, the professionals who were there interpreted that those problems were part of the typical adaptation stage. And that with time, all those problems will, you know, go over. And that was true for some cases, but that wasn't true for these more difficult, these more complicated cases, where the initial difficulties were not only about the adaptation stage, it was about the basic bonding it was about the basic commitment. It was, a, it was about the decision to parent that child and to parent that child forever. So uh, sometimes it, is, uh, it takes uh, some effort to understand when we are talking about some transient, adaptation type uh, difficulties, or when are we dealing with more profound problems. I'm sorry I need to uh, hurry a little bit um, due to, to time. Um, the unmet expectations are the second stream of the uh, adoptive parents uh, graph underground waters. Of course, we all parents have desires and preferences when we think of becoming parents. Uh, very often, or, uh, obviously more in the case of uh, adoption, the adopted children don't match our desires and preferences, and usually not because they are we, they bring pleasant surprises uh, to us. It's more normally because <coughs> their uh, some of their characteristics, gender, race, and particularly age, and particularly special needs, don't match what we expected, what we wanted, what we desired, and. Very often, the children come with unexpected behavioral problems, behavioral issues. And uh, so um, these unmet expectations about the characteristics and the behavior of the child increase our stress, our dissatisfaction, our emotional distance with uh, the child. And this exacerbates and makes more and more important the need of support. There are some circumstances that aggravate the negative impact of the unmet expectations. The poor pre-adoption preparation. It is so critical to help parents to understand that these difficulties will be there, that these unmet expectations will be there. And uh, doing it not to mean that you are trying to convince them not to adopt. but to mean that you want them to make a responsible decision, <coughs> knowing that these difficulties and these unmet expectations could be there. Some of the problems we find in prospective adopters are in the two extremes. Sometimes the expectations are too flexible. I can, I'm ready to find any time. You know, love can achieve everything. And I will give, I have so much love to give that uh, you know, any child will make me happy, uh, which is normally not the case. 
And the opposite is also true. When the expectations are too rigid, when you can only be made happy by a girl, age seven, and you know, blue eyes or whatever. So uh, when the expectations are either too rigid or too flexible, I think that we adoption professionals should spend a little bit more of time working with those prospective adopters. And once the child is at home, the lack of flexibility to adapt to the child's real uh, characteristics. And uh, this uh, becomes more complicated when there is a lack of mutual support inside the family, uh, in, 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 particularly in couples. The problem is that the uh, mismatch in expectations together with the emotional distance sometimes created for these unmet expectations and the parents' own emotional issues, they tend to create a situation where the placement is in serious difficulties, is at grave, uh, at grave risk. How I, I think that we have never studied, no one has studied children unmet expectations. I, 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 I was preferring the other. As I was preparing this, I, I was thinking, well, I'm sure that the children, I have talked to many adopted children, and I remember one who said, well, you know, and these were in, in, um, in centers, in, in, in children institutions, in, in orphanages, and all that. So I saw that couple who came to um, take my um, friend uh, with them, they came with such a huge car, and they were looking so great, and I thought, well, my parents will be like those. I want that you know, <laughs> car, I want those parents. And, and, and then she was uh, adopted by a single mother, who was wonderful, whose car was smaller, <laughs> and uh, maybe more long lasting, who knows. But uh, we never, I, I don't think anyone has done any work about the children's unmet expectations, but there must be there. And they must play a role. And again, the lack of support is an, a problem. It's a problem here. So, coming to an end, um, we have these rough waters inside the child, these rough waters inside the adopters, the, 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 uh, the parents. And the problem, I think, is that when the main thing is that when the child's underground rough waters, emotional vulnerability, identity issues, coincide with the parents' underground waters, rough waters, their own emotional difficulties, the unmet expectations, then the placement is at risk. And when this happens, the surface rough waters in both the child and the parents, uh, in terms of um, difficult behaviors, in terms of in sensitive, harsh parenting, this tends to exacerbate problems and risk. And in these cases, I believe that perhaps only effective professional support can bring some hope. And it is very important that these professionals have competence in adoption-related issues. And I think that the case of Monica that I talked about before shows how important it is that the clinicians who are going to work with these children understand some of their uh, complexities. So most adoptive children, adopted children and most adoptive parents navigate successfully their, both their calm and rough waters, and that is true for many of us. It doesn't mean that there are no difficulties because uh, swimming against the tide is tiring and, and very often is quite frustrating. Frustrating. I think that the key ingredients are the emotional attunement with the child, an emotional attunement with a reparative capacity, able to fix the broken down rudder uh, of the child, open, warm communication and mutual adjustment, including the expectations, are, in my view, the key ingredients for adoptive parenting. Of course, not to forget the um, surface waters, not to forget the management of behavioral issues, 
and sometimes when needed with adequate and timely professional support. As Hal was saying at the beginning, I like cooking. So I'm giving you the list of the ingredients, but I cannot give you a recipe because you have to find, you have to write your own recipe depending on your taste, on your characteristics, on your preference, on what you know how to do. There are things I don't know how to do. If I were asked to do them, I wouldn't, and if I am asked to behave in a way that it is not natural to me, that I cannot use, I, I will be in trouble. And uh, my parenting will be kind of, uh, you know, debilitated, will be kind of uh, 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 being made less effective. So I don't have the recipe. You have to find your own recipe. But I hope that this list of ingredients can be taken home uh, and can be used in the daily tasks, the daily wonderful and complex tasks of being adoptive parents. Thank you.